Hello, uh, I'm Alan Kreider, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to Resident But Alien, How the Early Church Grew, a series of six videos. This is number two. In the first video, we looked at the way in which in the early th first three centuries of the church's history, the Christian church was growing rapidly. Uh, by approximately, on average, 40% per decade until by the early fourth century there were about six million Christians in the Roman Empire. And they were growing despite the fact that during this period it was against the law to be a Christian, Christians could uh, be scorned, they could be um, experience disadvantages at work and business, and at worst they could be killed. Nevertheless, despite these unpropitious circumstances, the church was growing. And the question is, of course, why? The first video suggested that churches were growing in part because the Christians themselves were odd but intriguing. And now in the second video, we're going to look at that further. I'm working together with Molly and with Quentin. And we're going to be looking at early Christian art. We're going to be looking at some early Christian writings. And we're going to be asking why this growth and we're going to be noting that it wasn't because their worship was attractive. The early Christians were not going, growing because their worship was attractive because the outsiders weren't allowed into their worship. And so it had to be other reasons. And I'm going to be proposing that it's because of a kind of synergy between spiritual power and life-giving deviance that the church was growing. Power. There were reports that God was alive and active among these people. And I think that people are drawn to the presence and activity of God. And deviance. There were reports that the Christians were living in ways that were life-giving, odd, question-posing, but alive. So I want to start by looking at the exclusion of the outsiders from the early Christian worship. Why did the early Christians grow? Not because their worship was attractive. So let's look at an early Christian document. With regard to fervor of spirit, let the deacon have a perfect manner of life. Let him observe and look at those who come into the house of the sanctuary. Let him investigate who they are, so that he may know if they are lambs or wolves. And when he asks, let him bring in those that are worthy, lest, if a spy enter, the liberty of the church be searched out and the deacon's sin be on his own head. What do you make of that? <laughs> Sounds all very suspicious. <laughs> yeah. And it shows kind of the battle that they were up against, mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. felt like there was a very perceived enemy yeah. and people who yeah. were kind of out to get them. So. Okay, mm -hmm. spies. This mm -hmm. document actually comes from the century of Constantine, and so Christianity is legal at this point, but it has the heritage of feeling danger endangered. And uh, so they're wor worried about spies, aren't they? Yeah. And what does the deacon do? He, he's observing and looking at everyone that's coming into the house of sanctuary. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. like he's approving or yeah. disapproving those that come okay. in. Let's in the lambs and keeps out the wolves. Okay. So, yeah. And the lambs were those who were baptized or those who were being catechized. And the wolves were the outsiders, the pagans, people that he didn't know, people who couldn't produce a letter from some other congregation. And so he stands there at the door, and there is, there is this fear, isn't there? There's this sense of danger. Um, now, what this tells us about worship is, are there outsiders in the worship? No. No. <laughs> it's something, isn't it? Yeah. So here what we've got is a, a church that is really a pagan-free zone. It's a church in which the deacon stands in the door, and he knows that there's a way into the church, and the way to the church is through catechesis and baptism. But at this point, it's his job to protect the church's uh, separate existence. Now, to get a sense of what this a congregation might have looked like, and here, here we have the word, the house of the sanctuary, let's look at the earliest known Christian uh, meeting place. This was a domestic building that was converted to be a house of the church around 240. And you note down in the right-hand corner, the vestibule. That's where the deacon would have been. 
Okay. He would have stood there, he would have evaluated people and admitted them then to the courtyard. And then the assembly hall is on the left there, which is where they would have had their services. Up at the top right, you see the baptistry. And then in the middle at the top and down at the bottom on the left, there were other rooms. And then there was an upstairs. And so this was a domestic dwelling that had been converted to a kind of community center for the life of the church. And uh, there probably would have been uh, maybe a, a cleric, a priest who would have lived there. There might have been accommodation for visitors who were coming. This gives us a bit fuller sense of what it's like. Mercifully, I mean, for us as scholars, but mercifully it survived because it was destroyed by the Persians around 255. And so now we can see, see that door down at the bottom? That's where the deacon would have been. And you see then the people meeting in the assembly hall and the baptistry. So this is the setting of early Christianity, a pagan free zone, which Bishop Cyprian of Carthage called an enclosed garden. And so the early Christian movement was spreading, not because its worship was attractive to outsiders, because the deacons were standing in the door as bouncers to keep the outsiders out. The worship of the early Christians wasn't designed to be attractive to the outsiders. It was rather designed to enable the Christians to ascribe worth to God and then to allow God to build them up, to edify them as attractive Christ-like people and as communities which were attractive to outsiders. And so it wasn't the Christian worship that was attractive to outsiders. It was the Christians that were attractive. Hmm. Now you can imagine that these enclosed services led to gossip. These meetings, secretive meetings, were fascinating and people had rumors of kissing going on, eating body, drinking blood. So the meetings were closed but fascinating. They were designed to shape the group and they, the movement did not grow because their meetings were attractive. So if not that, why? And my contention is that the early church grew because the believers themselves and the life that they enjoyed together, these were attractive. In what ways? In what way were they attractive? And I want to point to two ways in which the Christian movement was attractive to outsiders. And these were spiritual power and what I call life-giving deviance. So let's start with spiritual power. The early Christians were attractive because they seemed to be in touch with divine power. In the first video, we met Perpetua, who with her friends and fellow Christians was in the process of being persecuted to death in the arena in Carthage in North Africa around 200. And in the midst of this account of the martyrdom of these people, we encounter the following phrase, which uh, occurs. It says, the, the prison officer began to show us great honor, realizing that we possess some great power within us. Great power? These are prisoners. These are ultimately powerless people. These are people who are going to be killed. And here is a prison officer who looks at them and sees them as people of great power. That even in dire circumstances, they're, e they're able to, I would imagine that they were at peace, that they yeah. were calm, that they yeah. were still able to act out their faith even in persecution. I think so. It's utterly remarkable. And by the end of this story, this story of Perpetua, chapter 21, this prison officer becomes a believer. So spiritual power, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are doing dramatic things, but it means that there is a sense that God is alive and God is at work among them. And people can, can see that. But it could also take more dramatic forms. We're going to be looking now at a story that occurs in the life of Origen, who was the greatest of the early Christian theologians. 
a brilliant, articulate man, learned in philosophy, learned also in the Christian scriptures, and a teacher. A teacher, first of all, in Alexandria, which is where he was from in Egypt, and then in Caesarea in Palestine. And around 240, here he is in the middle of catechizing people who will be baptized, and he's catechizing them about the story of Hannah from 1 Samuel chapter 2. As he's teaching the story of Hannah, when he quoted Hannah's words, my heart exults in the Lord, the account reads, a woman cried out and fell down and shouted out in agony. And people gathered around her and they began to pray. And Origen, this catechist, this teacher, continued to say repeatedly, according to the source, my spirit exalts in the Lord, my spirit exalts in the Lord. Origen saw this as exorcising a demon. And this is Origen's comment. Things like this lead many people to be converted to God, many to reform themselves, many to come to faith. There are in fact lots of people who do not believe in the word and who do not receive the delivery of the teaching. But when the demon seizes them, then they become converted. This kind of thing occurs frequently. What strikes you in it? Well, that people are, are rejecting the gospel mm -hmm. until they, they witness something with their own eyes. Something about power mm -hmm. leads to conversion. And there's spiritual struggle in conversion. There is a widespread belief in demonic presence and power. And early Christianity spread, not least because it could offer people through the ministry of its exorcists, liberation from that which had oppressed them. And remember, this is an Oxford theologian. I mean, this is the top theologian of the church at this time. So it's, a, it's a, a, an interesting and telltale thing. People encounter in, in, around the world in Africa, Latin America, encounter this kind of struggle today uh, in which the church grows because of healing or because God sets people free from demonic oppression. And for a long time, these documents were present in the early uh, Christian writings and scholars simply jumped over them because they didn't fit the scholar's worldview. And now scholars are starting to look at them and to try to come to terms with them. Uh, and some scholars have pointed out that the perhaps the most frequently cited reason by the early Christians for the growth of the church was that it provided freedom from the power of fate and demons. Addiction, that which puts people in bondage. So why did the early church grow? It grew because of divine power. And let's look at a couple of pictures. What do you think that is? It looks like a depiction of the, the story of the lady reaching out to touch the, the hem of Jesus' garment. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Someone who is um, serving yeah. another, yeah. who's humbling themselves. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So an early depiction of Jesus as healer and the woman uh, being healed, healing something that keeps getting... Uh, uh, recorded in early Christian art. Here's another sample. This comes from that house church that I was showing you. You might find that one hard to figure out. What do you, what do you see there? It is quite hard to make out. It, um, you can see a person up on the, the top of the picture, but I'm not okay, sure. Okay, that's what. Jesus. Is okay. there someone else to the lower left? There is. Who's carrying, oh, it's um, um, carrying the cot. <laughs> He's carrying a bed. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you can see that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, here, this is from Mark, uh, I think, chapter two. I mean, the person, the paralytic, is now, get up, take your bed and yes. walk. Yeah. And so he's taking his bed and walking. And, and, you know, you never thought that you'd be seeing a picture of a third century bed. But um, no. here, here is another third century bed. Uh, and is this the same story? Same story. Yeah, he's, here's this paralytic who is carrying the, carrying the bed, and uh, you see his head sticking through the mattress. Yeah. Which, uh, 
And I'll be comfortable. Is that a child kneel, or just someone kneeling to the left? I'm not sure who that is to the left. Yeah. But this points to the centrality of healing in early Christian depictions of Jesus. But let's look at the next one. Jesus in the middle, holding a wand. A wand. A wand. Mm -hmm. And then up to the right, under the wand. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like an Egyptian mummy or something. Precisely. um. It's Lazarus. Ah. (laughs) You know, so Jesus is setting, restoring Lazarus to life. And you see then Mary kneeling Mm -hmm. at Jesus' feet. feet. But there are frequent depictions in early Christian art of Jesus the healer, or oh, the, 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 the life restorer of Lazarus. For example, here's another one. You note how much taller Jesus is than Lazarus. Um, that's just an iconog- iconographic convention. But note Jesus having a, a wand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See that sticking out? So here is Jesus, once again, the healer. And so, I mean, why is the early church growing? The early church is growing according to both pictures and the written record, because God is at work. God is alive. And God is doing things that are surprisingly gracious that make a difference for people, manifesting divine power, spiritual power. But there's a second reason, and this is that the Christians themselves were deviant, life-givingly deviant. It's striking how many of the documents about early Christianity have to do with their lifestyle. If we looked at Christians today talking about the faith, it's unlikely that that many Christian writings about people today would talk about how Christians live. But back then they kept pointing to the ways in which the Christians lived as somehow exemplary of the faith. And so we're going to look at an illustration of this from the writing of Tertullian who was the first great theologian to write in the Latin language and who wrote uh, early in the third century, um, living in Carthage. In this, we find Tertullian thinking about a situation in which a Christian woman, and we know there were more Christian women than men, she marries a pagan husband and thinks about the kind of problems that they as a couple are going to have. And so Tertullian points out these problems and he notes the ways that are unconventional that a Christian woman, a stereotyped, idealized woman might live. And let's, let's see what these are like. Who indeed would permit his wife to go about the streets to the houses of strangers, calling at every shack in town in order to visit the brothers? Who would be pleased to permit his wife to be taken from his side when she is required to be present at evening devotions? Or to take another example, who would not be concerned when she spends the whole night away from the house during the Easter solemnities? Who without feeling some suspicion would let her go to be present at the Lord's Supper when such vile rumors are spread about it? Who would allow her to slip into prison to kiss the chains of a martyr? Or for that matter, to greet any one of the brothers with a kiss? Who would allow her to wash the feet of the saints, to fill them with food and drink? Who would permit her to desire such things, or even to think of them? If one of the brothers, in traveling, stops at her house, what hospitality will he receive in the house of a pagan? When an infidel woman is called to the practice of heavenly virtue, by an act of the divine condescension, this very fact inspires a feeling of awe in the heart of the spouse who remains a pagan. As a result, he will be less violent in his attacks on the faith, less threatening, less suspicious. He has been brought into touch with the miraculous. He has ocular evidence of the truth. He sees that his wife has changed into a better person, and thus, through reverential awe, he himself becomes a seeker after God. She's quite a lady. Quite a lady. Quite a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's um, quite independent, but also a servant Mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. She seems brave to be going into prisons mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. visit those who are being chained up. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And she's generous. She's hospitable to any any stranger that comes near her house. A lot of Christians were traveling. And so hospitality was something that would have put strain, probably, on that household. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you sense about the economic life of the early church there? I'm guessing these people probably didn't have much, Mm -hmm. but maybe that was something that marked them as Mm -hmm. Christians, Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. what they had, they Mm -hmm. shared with Mm -hmm. those traveling through. They did. And uh, if you note at the very start there, here is a woman who goes about the streets to shacks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so here is somebody who probably has relatively more in her household, but she is very much involved with the people who have less. So the church again is sociologically encompassing, not of the aristocratic men, they were the last to come to faith, but of uh, other segments of, of society at this point. Now, what does this tell us about worship? Mm. It seems like every, every part of their daily lives was worship, yeah. um, they, mm. just the living out of their faith. Mm-hmm. And that it was meant to be done as families because she's um, the wife is required to be present at evening devotions yeah. and at Easter celebrations. And the Easter celebrations, the great Easter vigil, when they would all gather together and they would greet then the resurrection. So this is something. And it was an all-night kind of thing. You can imagine husbands raising eyebrows. Mm-hmm. What's going on? Well, and especially when it says that there were vile rumors that were spread about these Easter, yeah. Easter celebrations. Yeah. I could. Yeah. And you see the kiss again, both of the martyrs' feet, but also of the brothers. And yet, there's an effect, isn't there? An effect upon the husband. Quite a dramatic effect, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. And it says that when he sees that his wife has been changed into a better person, yeah. it's, it's in seeing that she's changed, yeah. um, that he himself becomes mm-hmm. a seeker after God. Yeah, And it's something that um, she does all of these things that might raise suspicion, Mm -hmm. but because her husband can see Mm -hmm. what a true person she is, Mm -hmm. that he is in fact Mm -hmm. changed and converted himself. A classic way that people became believers in the early centuries was through the wife leading the husband to faith. I mean, it still happens. You know, but it was it was very much a pattern at that point. And this is true to that kind of thing. I think that we we shouldn't assume that there was any woman just like this. You know, but here is a kind of composite picture of a community of women who are functioning in a way that is just question posing for people, question posing for the person most immediately present, namely the husband, but also to anybody else. And note the way in which this is a kind of explication of love. Care on many dimensions. Tertullian, who wrote this, is the one who said, look how they love one another. And so here is love in action on many dimensions, and it is life-givingly deviant. Now, I believe that this was attractive. I believe that this was missionally very important. We note that the husband was aware that he had come into touch with the miraculous. And so the power of God is at work here. But so also is a lifestyle that is animated by God's power, by the teaching of Jesus, to be distinctive. So why the early church growing? The early church tended to point to these two reasons. They tended to point to the power of God, and they tended to point to the kind of behavior that God's power had animated in order to make them attractive. And I'd like to close with a brief quote from another North African writer from uh, just about this period. It's very brief, but it has a punch. As for the daily increase in our numbers, that is no proof of error, but evidence of merit. For beauty of life encourages its followers to persevere and strangers to join the ranks. We do not preach great things, but we live them. We do not preach great things, but we live them. It's not our worship that attracts people. It's not our sermons 
that attract people, but rather it's embodied faith, embodied in a community and embodied in attractive disciples of Jesus. In the sense of God at work, transforming individuals and communities, these are the things that draw people to a growing church.